Hello and welcome to our Sunday worship here at St Andrew's Church in Inverurie. Today is Sunday the 30th of August. Some sad news, one of our members, Norman Rennie, died on Thursday. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all who knew him. This week's intimations are posted next to the link you followed to reach this recording. We are still on track for worshipping again in our church building on Sunday the 13th of September and I for one can hardly wait. There will be a telephone booking system in place. All details are in the September issue of the Saltire magazine and on our Facebook page. Our readings for next Sunday are Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 14 and the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come together still physically distanced but spiritually together to worship you. We know that you are our God, our Creator, our Heavenly Father. We know that we have the privilege of coming before you, not because we have any merit in ourselves, but because through your Son, Jesus, we have been adopted into your family, and it is our joy to come together to worship you. Father, families come in all shapes and sizes, but your family is the most varied of all. One of the many wonderful things about membership of your family is it does not depend on an accident of birth. It comes about simply through accepting your invitation. And we all say yes. In saying yes to you, we know that we should put your will above ours. We should love our neighbours as we love ourselves. And we should strive to see you in everyone we meet. But this is so hard, Father, and like naughty children, we behave in ways we have been told not to. We put our will above yours. We love ourselves more than we love our neighbours, and we fail to recognise you in those we meet. And like naughty children, we come before you now to admit to our misdemeanours. We come with heads bowed, knowing full well that punishment is deserved. Yet, Father, you surprise us again and again by accepting our confession, forgiving our sin, and welcoming us not as naughty children, but as beloved daughters and sons. Indeed, you see us not as we are, but as Jesus was, perfect and free from sin. Help us to be more like him, Father. Help us to be more obedient to your will more loving of our neighbours and more able to see you in others. Help us, we pray, to be more worthy of calling ourselves Christian. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Hear the word of God. While tending the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses led the flock along the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him as a fire blazing out from a bush. Although the bush was on fire, it was not being burnt up. And Moses said to himself, I must go across and see this remarkable sight. Why ever does the bush not burn away? Then, when the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to look, he called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. He answered him, Here I am. God said, Do not come near. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have witnessed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know what they are suffering and have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that country into a fine broad land 
a land flowing with milk and honey, the ter territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Now the Israelites' cry has reached me, and I have also seen how hard the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I shall send you to Pharaoh, and you are to bring my people Israel out of Egypt. But who am I? Moses said to God, that I should approach Pharaoh, and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt. God answered, I am with you. This will be your proof that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God here at this mountain. Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and tell them that the God of their forefathers has sent me to them, and they ask me his name, what am I to say to them? God answered, I am that I am. Tell them, I am has sent you to them. He continued, You are to tell the Israelites that it is the Lord, the God of their forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who has sent you to them. This is my name forever. This is my title in every generation. And turning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. From that time, Jesus began to make it clear to his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and endure great suffering at the hands of the elders, chief priests and scribes, to be put to death and to be raised again on the third day. At this, Peter took hold of him and began to rebuke him. Heaven forbid, he said. No, Lord, you should, this shall never happen to you. Then Jesus turned and said to Peter, Out of my sight, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You think as men think, not as God thinks. Jesus then said to his disciples, Anyone who wishes to be a follower of mine must renounce self. He must take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What will anyone gain by winning the whole world at the cost of his life? Or what can he give to buy his life back? For the Son of Man is come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will give everyone his due reward. Truly I tell you, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death before they have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word, and to him goes all praise and glory. Last week we read how Moses, an Israelite baby, came to be raised in the house of Pharaoh. We now rejoin Moses about 80 years later. He had fled Egypt 40 years earlier after killing an Egyptian overseer who he saw badly beating an Israelite. Exile had not been unkind to Moses. One day, sitting by a well, he saw the seven daughters of a priest of Midian drawing water and filling troughs so that their father's sheep could drink. Some shepherds tried to chase them off, but Moses came to their aid. Clearly, he was a man who acted whenever he saw injustice. This incident not only meant that Moses found a new home with the priest, but he also married one of the seven daughters, Zipporah, and they now had a son, Gershom. Our reading began describing what had become an everyday part of Moses' life tending his father's in-law's sheep. He was in the western side of the wilderness, on the slopes of a mountain called Horeb. Moses was not a priest, he was not a prophet, he was just a shepherd, going about his normal day. And he was in the wilderness, not a temple. No indication to mark this bit of wilderness from any other. The whole scene was quite ordinary, mundane even. But God really does work in mysterious ways. And this would not be the last time that God delivered a message of hope to a shepherd in the wilderness. 
and it would not be the last time that he would use non-religious setting for a revelation of the word. So for us, with the benefit of hindsight, the setting for what would transpire comes as no surprise. The name Horeb actually means wasteland, and here in this wasteland Moses saw a strange sight indeed, a bush that seemed to be on fire, but the flames were not consuming the plant. This detail is often skipped over, but it does have significance. Moses heard God talking to him from the flames. The word of God was coming from the fire. But the word of God doesn't destroy. It creates, and so the bush remained unburnt. It was with his word that God created the world, and many years later, the word of God became flesh, a baby born in Bethlehem. It's worth noting that scripture is full of recurring themes that surround God's actions. Last week we heard echoes of God watching over Noah in the ark, with Moses' sister Miriam watching over her baby brother as he was kept safe from the waters of the Nile in a specially prepared basket. And this week we see the word of God sending Moses to rescue his people from slavery in Egypt as a forerunner to that same word of God becoming flesh to rescue all peoples from the slavery of sin. And notice, it was only as Moses approached the burning bush that God spoke. By moving towards the strange sight, Moses opened himself up to God. God does not force himself upon us. He invites us into relationship. For Moses, the invitation took the form of a burning bush, and his response was to approach it. Only then did God speak, telling him to remove his sandals because he was on holy ground. Now, the ground itself was not inherently holy. It was the near presence of God that made it so. God is many things, creator, sustainer, king, judge, heavenly father, and so on. But he is also holy, and his holiness demands respect. Removing sandals that dirt is not trailed onto ground made holy by God's presence is a simple yet clear act of respect. And once Moses had shown this respect, God established who he is is the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Notice, the God of your father. Although brought up in Pharaoh's household, adopted by an Egyptian princess, Moses knew full well that he was an Israelite. That's why he had killed an Egyptian to save a fellow Israelite. And so it was the Israelite God who spoke to him the God of his father. We know that the Egyptian gods were mere idols, and here Moses was being left in no doubt that the Israelite God is very real. Moses was terrified and hid his face, fearing that if he looked at God he would die. God told Moses that he had seen Israel suffering at the hands of the Egyptians and the time had come for him to act. Again we see God working to his time scale, not ours. Way back in Genesis chapter 15, God had told Ab Abram, Know this for certain, your descendants will be aliens living in a land that is not their own. They will be enslaved and held in oppression for 400 years. That time was now up. And God was sending Moses to fulfill his promise, to bring the Israelites out of slavery and into a fine, broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God did not attend, intend simply to rescue the Israelites from something, that is, from oppression. He also planned to lead them into something, a land, a broad land flowing with milk and honey. In the same way that today Jesus does not want to rest just to rescue us from sin, 
but he also wants to welcome us into his family. Moses, having fled Egypt to save his own life, and having settled into a relatively comfortable lifestyle with his wife and son, was reluctant to return. So he questioned his suitability for the task. Notice how God sought to reassure Moses, saying that he would be with him. God wants our willing obedience. He did not command Moses. He did not force Moses. He persuaded Moses, demonstrating his desire for relationship. But the proof that God would be with Moses in his mission would be when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God here on this mountain. Notice the proof would come after Moses had left the Israelites out of Egypt. In the meantime, Moses would have to take God's word on trust as a willing participant. Or put another way, Moses would have to act in faith. Still not wholly committed to the adventure, Moses tried another tack, asking, if I come to the Israelites and tell them that the God of their forefathers has sent me to them, and they ask me his name, what am I to say to them? God answered, I am that I am. Tell them that I am has sent you to them. Now, in that place at that time, a name revealed something about its bearer. Remember, Pharaoh's daughter named the baby Moses because she drew him out of the water. The Hebrew name Moses, or Moshe, means drew. But God, how can any name reflect who God is? To even begin to do justice to who God is, a name would be far too long to be used. So God simply names himself I Am. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is more than everything. He just is. And so he names himself I Am. He does, however, clarify this for the Israelites, going on to say, You are to tell the Israelites that it is the Lord, the God of their forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who has sent you to them. Notice how God's revelation evolves. He revealed himself to Abraham and blessed his family that to the point it had become a nation, albeit a captive nation. Through that time, God had been known as the God of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But now God was revealing more of himself. Nothing had changed about God. His true name had not changed. It was just he was now revealing more to humanity than he had done before. An unfolding revelation that stretched down to Peter as he declared Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of the living God, as we saw last week. And from where our Gospel reading picks up the story this week. Peter was probably feeling on top of the world. Why? Well, if you remember, Jesus had asked his disciples who they thought he was, and Peter replied, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. To which Jesus said he was favoured, because that could only have been revealed to him by God, and that he was a rock and would receive the keys to heaven. Such praise undoubtedly left Peter elated. But... Jesus ten, then told the disciples of the necessity of his suffering, death and resurrection. And Peter managed the journey from hero to zero in record time. Jesus had just praised Peter, then told the disciples how he must suffer, and Peter immediately took hold of Jesus and began to rebuke him. But Jesus responded, Out of my sight, Satan! Peter went from being blessed to being called Satan in what it must have been a minute or two. I can just imagine how puffed up Peter was when Jesus told him he was best blessed and how he wanted to crawl into a hole when Jesus called him Satan. It was as if the proverb, 
Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, had been written just for that moment. But why did Jesus react like this? Because Peter thought as men think, not as God thinks, and that is the root cause of sin. As soon as we depart from God's will, selfishness takes over, and sin is the inevitable consequence. Which is precisely why we must always come back to the Bible. Not once in a while, not just every Sunday, but as a regular pattern of life. In the final part of our Gospel reading, Jesus said that whoever wanted to be his disciple had to renounce self, take up his cross and follow him. Expanding on this, Jesus said that whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those who put themselves first, instead of placing the gospel first, will be unsuccessful in their self-preservation goals, because it is only Jesus' message that leads to eternal life. Sometimes I'm asked why we see bad people prospering, and the short answer is, I don't know. But we can rest assured that they will not escape judgment. As Jesus said here, what will anyone gain by winning the whole world at the cost of his life? Or what can he give to buy his life back? For the Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will give everyone his due reward. Bad people may seem to prosper for now, and good people may seem to suffer for now. But here we read that Jesus will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and when he does, he will give everyone his due reward. Those who have accepted him, he will accept. But those who have rejected him will learn too late just how big a mistake they made. And Jesus said one more thing. That at first sight may seem like an unfulfilled prophecy. He said, truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Yet we know all those disciples present did indeed die, and Jesus has not yet returned. But Jesus' promise has more than one level of fulfilment. Six days later, three of his disciples would witness Jesus' transfiguration as he spoke on a mountaintop with Moses and Elijah. And all of them would witness the resurrection of Jesus, his ascension, and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Clearly, Jesus' prophecy was unsurprisingly fulfilled. In our own Old Testament reading, God spoke to Moses from a bush which, although on fire, was not consumed, because the word of God does not destroy. In Jesus, that word became flesh. The light of the world seen in the flames of the burning bush was born in Bethlehem and given the name Jesus. In him, God is revealed, but only to the eye of faith. To others, God is hidden in Christ and they cannot see him. Peter was the first to receive this revelation, followed by James and John at the Transfiguration. And in time, this revelation was made to each of the disciples and countless believers ever since. And once Jesus has been revealed as the Christ, once we come to know him, the only response we can properly make is to give ourselves to him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray again. Almighty God, as we learn more of the immense timescales you work to, it seems almost silly to come to you with our petitions. But Jesus demonstrated for us a life of prayer, and he urges us to do the same. And Jesus assures us that when we ask in his name, our prayers will be answered. So we make these requests to you in his name. 
but they are not selfish requests. They are our pleas on behalf of others. Lord, we pray for all who are working to restore our congregation and the congregations of other churches to worship again in their buildings. We ask you to guide them to the right decisions, to lead them in making the appropriate preparations and to be with the congregations as they come together again after a long time worshipping apart. Ease their worries, Lord, and keep them safe. But Lord, help us also to remember the lessons that we have learnt over the past months, that we can worship you anywhere, that we can involve people who, for whatever reason, are unable to come to the church building, and that our worship can take many different forms as long as it comes from our hearts and is directed to you. Father, even as we look forward to coming together again, we remember those who have been affected more than us by this pandemic. We remember key workers who have carried out their duties diligently, often in the face of possible harm to themselves. We remember those who have struggled socially or financially during the time of lockdown. We remember those who contracted COVID-19, those who recovered but still have side effects to cope with, those who are still fighting the virus and those who were defeated by it. We pray also for their family and friends who are placed under strain of helping a loved one or who are coping with the loss of someone they held dear. We pray for all who are grieving, Father, regardless of the cause of their grief. In particular, we pray for those who knew and loved Norman Rennie and mourn his loss. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers, which we raise to you through our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Now receive Christ's blessing. Go in the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfil your calling as servants of Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be on you and remain with you now and evermore. Amen.